awesome, man. Wasn't that phenomenal? Absolutely. I read the scripture to our uh, students before we uh, kicked off the service. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for all believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Amen? Awesome job. Y'all give them, show them some love one more time. Great, great job. Very, very proud of our students. Did a phenomenal job and they continuing to do so. And don't forget, we do have a youth barbecue luncheon right after the service. And students, if you are serving in that capacity, make sure toward the end of the service, around the invitation, if you guys will go over there and make sure you got everything ready to rock and roll, um, it's going to be a great time. Also, we are, there's another student we're very, very proud of. Um, the big dog is what I'm going to call them. Mr. Jordan Holly set a teenage world, world record a few weeks back, 530 pounds in squat, 578 pounds in deadlift. I can't pick up that much, but um, set a world record. So we want to just congratulate you, buddy. Congratulations, Jordan. We're proud of you, man. <laughs> proud of all of our young people. Amen. As you can see, Pastor Mark is not here today. Um, back in October, we took up a little love offering. Um, he did not know I was going to do that, but I he went outside. I said, close the doors. Y'all remember that a few months back? It took up a little uh, love offering to uh, for Pastor Appreciation Month, which was back in October, and uh, took up around $1,500. So they got them a little cruise getaway, and that was the stipulation. I said, Pastor Mark, here's the deal, man. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to have to tell you. I'm going to have to tell you what to do. And he said, what are we talking about? I said, well, we took up a love offering for Pastor Appreciation. We love you. We appreciate you. He said, well, what, what am I going to do with it? I said, I'm about, I'm about to tell you what you're going to do with it. You're going to get on a big boat, and you're going to go way out in the ocean where you have no cell phone service. That's what you got to do with it. So Pastor Mark is on a big boat, him and his, him and his bride, and they're way out in the ocean, so they, can, they have no cell phone service this week. So to unplug, to recharge, to, uh, to get away, and to just to spend some quality, quality time uh, with each other, and we are super honored and thankful for Pastor Mark and Miss Stephanie Pritchett. Can we show some love to our, our leadership, our pastors? Amen. They do a great job. So they're going to be gone all week. So if you need anything, call Tyler. He'll be glad to answer the phone for you. Um, I'm just kidding. You call any one of us, man. Myself, uh, Tracy, and Tyler, and Keith, and Sean. We'll be glad to, to, to help you guys in any way this week. So um, I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump right on in. And uh, while I pray, if I could have a volunteer bring me a bottle of water, that'd be phenomenal. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you, God, so, so very much. For loving us, God, I just thank you so much, God, for uh, this morning, God, for our students leading us in a time of worship, uh, in time of worship and song, a time of worship and our giving. God, we're thankful, God, for their talents. God, we're thankful, God, for their abilities, Lord, and they want to use those for you. Uh, And God, we're just grateful, Lord, that you have blessed this church with just uh, some great young people, Lord, uh, that want to see you shine, God. And uh, and I know, God, they're up here for the right reasons, and they want to point people to you, Jesus. So, God, I'm thankful for them. We're proud of our students, and God, I just pray uh, for a great turnout, Lord, for the uh, donation luncheon after church, Father, as well. And God, we pray for Pastor Mark and uh, Miss Stephanie, God, as they're out this week, Lord, just on a good, just getaway time, Lord, uh, just to recharge their batteries, just to, uh, to have some time off, Lord, and just really invest in themselves. God, we're thankful, God, for these, t- these times we can get together with our family and just kind of unplug and really pour into each other. So God, we pray, God, for safe travels for them. Pray, God, they'll have a lot of laughs, a lot of memories, and uh, God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Amen. Unreal. That's the sermon series that Pastor Mark started a few weeks back. We're wrapping that series up this morning. Unrealistic expectations uh, in regards to the Holy Spirit. He did a couple weeks ago. Unrealistic expectations in regards to marriage. Last week, how many of you guys were blessed with that series? I know I certainly was. Um, I hope it encouraged you and challenged you to go out and uh, Google uh, the five love languages and take the quiz and figure out where you fall in that category. Uh, But it was really, really good. Um, t- today we're attacking unreal expectations in regards to evangelism. Something I'm really passionate about. Pastor Mark came to me and said, David, you know, I'm going to be gone this, this upcoming week. I want you to preach on evangelism. I said, man, that's, that's awesome. I love it. Absolutely love it. That would be great. Um, so today is uh, unrealistic expectations in regards to evangelism. But here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to preach up here till I'm blue in the face on why you should evangelize. I feel like I've done that a thousand times. I feel like Pastor Mark has done that a thousand times. And I feel like you know why you should. I believe that you know the Great Commission, that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I believe that you know that, and you understand that, and you get that, that people die every single day. 100,000 people die every day. That's one person every two and a half seconds. Somebody dies every day, every few moments. And the the question is, are they dying, and are they with Jesus, or are they dying, or are they going to hell? And here's the problem. You and I have got to take responsibility for that. You and I have to take full responsibility that we are called, commissioned by God, to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's your and my 
commission, but it's also our great privilege. Can I get an amen? It is our privilege to share the gospel. It's our privilege to see people who have no hope, to gain hope, and be able to go out and live their life for their creator. I believe that you know why. So I'm not going to, I could do it. I could preach the why all day long, but I feel like I've done that a thousand times tonight. Today we're preaching the how. It's not the why of evangelism, not, not the unrealistic expectations of, of the why, but the how. It's just like anything else. If someone is challenging you, say, hey, man, you need to lose weight. You need to lose weight. You need to lose weight. Say, I get it. I get the why, right? I need to be healthier so I can run and play in the yard with my grandkids and so I can live longer and, and live a better life. I get the why. But if no one's ever stopped and, and showed you the how, well, here's how you can do it. Here's some workout regiments. Here's some exercise routines. Here's a diet plan. You, they may just be setting you up for failure by always pointing the finger and telling you, you need to go do this. You need to go do that. I get the why. But how do I do it? It's the same thing with, with, with the personal finances. You need to get out of debt. You need to get out of debt. You need to get out of debt. Okay, I get it. I get it. I need to get out of debt. I understand that. But how do I do that? Maybe no one's ever sat down and show you how to do a zero-based, dollar-for-dollar budget each and every month. Live underneath your means. Don't, don't, don't let your outgo exceed your income. I mean, just basic fundamentals so that way that you can do that. And it's the same thing with, with evangelism today. That I, I could preach and say, you need to go out. You need to share. You need to evangelize. You need to witness. But if I don't stop and show you how, I'm setting you up for failure. So today, really, it's not really an unrealistic expectation from, for you guys. This is coming at it from the angle of teachers and preachers and pastoral staff members. It's unrealistic for me to expect you, to, to, to encourage you to go out and live for Christ and share and evangelize if I've never stopped and taught you how. So it's unrealistic from my point of view for you to go out if no one's ever really showed you some good parameters, some good methods, some good approaches on how to do that. If you're with me, say, oh yeah. All right, here we go. Peter's direct approach. So we're going to fly through these. There's about six different approaches. I want you to hold on tight, okay? Peter's direct approach. I call this approach cut to the chase. Stop beating around the bush. Some people need this type of approach in their life when it comes to you sharing Christ. So let me give you a little backstory on why Peter has this direct approach of evangelism. Uh, if anybody has, has read much of the New Testament, you understand that Peter is a ready, fire, aim kind of guy. That's Peter, right? Ready, fire, and aim. That's just who he is. He's ready to jump the gun. He's not going to beat around the bush. He's going to be loud. He's going to be proud. And he's going to tell it like it is. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of learning that I need. That's the kind of, and some people call this the wake-up call approach, okay? Sometimes it's going to take some tough love for people to understand that they need to get their life right. Matthew 16, I love this, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he said, hey, who do people say that I am? The disciples kind of start murmuring and talking back and forth. Well, some say you're the prophet. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you might even be Jeremiah and all this stuff. And they're just kind of you know, throwing out some things. And Peter stands up and says, no, no, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, period. Underline, italicize, bold it, highlight it. You're the Christ. You're the one that has been prophesied about for thousands of years. Peter is bold. Peter is proud. Peter is direct. He cuts to the chase, straight to the point, doesn't beat around the bush. Matthew chapter 14, the disciples are going fishing. Disciples are going fishing. And uh, remember, Jesus is out on the water. And disciples are like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Is it a ghost? Is it a ghost? And someone said, no, that's, that's Jesus. And Jesus is walking on the water, and, and Peter says, well, Lord, if that's you, call me out, because I want to come out there and walk on the water. Who does that? Really? No one can do that. Peter's like, sign me up. I'm getting out of there. I'm walking on water, because I want to be next to my Savior. Again, he was bold. He was honest. He was true. He was a, a risk taker, a daredevil, if you will. Another good example was John chapter 18, where the soldiers come to arrest Jesus. The soldiers come to arrest Jesus, and what does Peter do? Right? Doggone Pirates of the Caribbean, baby. He done chopped off somebody's ear. That's what Peter did. He, he just waxed off somebody's ear. He said, no, I'm going to protect my Savior. He's going to step up to the plate. He's going to be on the side. You ain't taking my Savior, right? Cut the guy's ear off. The day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we're wrapping up here the why of Peter. Why is it a direct approach for Peter on the day of Pentecost? Jesus needed somebody who's going to step up to the plate amongst 4,000 people and preach the gospel. Who better to elect than Peter himself? to stand up in Jerusalem. Just a few weeks earlier, Jesus had been crucified, and here comes Peter standing up, stepping up to the plate amongst thousands of people, and he preaches, you better repent or you're going to perish. You better repent of your sin and put your faith in God for salvation. And Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says that Peter's words pierced the hearts of those listening, and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. 3,000 people. 
Peter said, I ain't got time for this. I'm going to cut straight to the chase. you got to repent or you're going to perish. You better turn or you're going to burn. Here's the deal. Peter's straight to the point. And some people need that kind of tough love. Some people need you to look and listen, I've done this, I've done this method a handful of times in my ministry. A handful of times. Half time, it worked good. Other half, not so good. But here's one time that it did work good. There was this young man in and out, riding the fence, kind of a lukewarm Christian. Well, everybody thought he was a Christian. He thought he was a Christian because he grew up in church. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian no more than swinging from a branch makes you a monkey. But here's the deal. I looked at that young man, and he, he was in the world sinning. He'd show up to church on Sunday. He was in the world sinning. He'd show up to church on Wednesday. I pulled him aside one Wednesday, and I said, look here, dude. You've got to stop playing games with God. You're going to bust hell wide open. His eyes got about this big. Let me just tell you, at the end of that service, guess who was the first one to come down and repent and give the life to Jesus? That young man was. I said, I, I, I'm not going to tiptoe around this issue, dude. You're living in sin. You keep living in sin. You don't repent. You're going to bust hell wide open. Finally, it was like a wake-up call. Something happened in his mind. He's like, oh, shoot, this junk's for real, isn't it? I said, man, you got to stop playing games with God. That's what that young man needed at that time. He needed somebody to look him straight in the face and say, listen, if you keep going down this path, you will destroy your life. You will hurt people that you love. You will destroy your testimony. And in the end, you will not be on the path that you want to be on. So you need to change. It's just that simple. It's just that quick. Change. Today, you can decide to change. Peter's direct approach. Some people need a straight shot to Jesus. Black and white, no gray. Some people need this direct approach of evangelism. And some people are good at delivering this type of evangelistic approach. Direct. You need somebody, some of y'all know you need somebody to shoot you straight. When you walk in and go, hey, does this look good? They go, nope, you need to change clothes. Right? Because they love you. Right? That person is bold and honest with you because they love you. Right? I shaved my head last night. And I came in and I said, Catherine, I said, uh, I said, how'd I do? She said, not good. You need to redo that side right there. Right? She could have said, oh, he looks pretty good, but you look good. You look good, man. But no, she shot me straight. David, you jack your head up. <laughs> and see, I, I'm doing it myself to save money, right? I was spending $30 a month on haircuts. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, dude. I spent 15 bucks at Walmart. I got my own buzzers. I'm shaving my own stinking head. I can save that money. And, and, now, and now she's like, yeah, I told you you need a professional to cut your hair, right? But I need somebody to just uh, shoot me straight. I need a wake-up call. Not everybody has that personality, though. But some people, you need that. So Peter's direct approach. Sometimes you can't beat around the bush. Number two, Paul's intellectual approach. Paul's intellectual approach. If you've read the Bible for any amount of time, you understand and realize that the Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. That's a lot of writing. That's a lot of preaching. It's a lot of church planting. Paul was a busy guy, very, very busy guy. But he was an intellect to be reckoned with. Listen to me. He was an intellect to be reckoned with. The Bible says that the Apostle Paul was fluent in five languages. Five languages. This guy was smart. He was intelligent. He was part of the Sanhedrin, which is a big deal. Part of the Jewish Supreme Court, basically. This guy was smart. He was intelligent. Highly educated. Romans chapter 1 or Colossians chapter 1. I encourage you to go read it. I don't have time to read it, the whole thing. But Romans chapter 1 or Colossians chapter 1, I encourage you to jot that down and go read it. And just kind of begin to see, wow, this guy was intelligent. This guy was very smart. And I promise you, somebody you didn't want to get in a debate with. I can assure you that. But Paul, I love, love Paul. Absolutely love him. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is going to uh, Athens. And along the road to Athens, there's a bunch of idols, a bunch of shrines. People are worshiping uh, animals. People are worshiping false gods. People are worshiping the planets. People are worshiping. And there's an altar. It says, to an unknown God. And Paul walked up to the temple, to the synagogue in Athens, amongst all these philosophers. He said, hey, I see that you're very religious in all your ways. I see that you're very religious. I even saw one altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Apostle Paul said, I'm about to tell you about this unknown God that you don't know about. And he begins to unfold a huge, massive theological and philosophical and intellectual debate amongst all these philosophers in the synagogue. And their minds are blown, and they're like, who is this guy? He's telling us about Jesus and telling us about God, the creator of the universe and, and everything. And they say, who is this guy? In Acts chapter 17, at, toward the end of the chapter, it says that many philosophers in that temple that day, skeptics, many believed in Jesus that day because of Paul's intellectual approach. Some people need logic. 
Some people, when it comes to evangelizing, some people, listen, you just got to put your big boy pants on and go read a book before you go talk to them. Because here's the deal. Some people need that reasoning. Some people need a logical explanation on how things happen and, and how the world is the way that it is. Some people need that. Some people, you, you go up to them and say, oh, man, yeah, yeah, it's just a walk of faith, brother. Some, no, I want you to show me how this is a walk of faith. Explain to me creation versus evolution. Please explain to me these theological questions of the Trinity. Please explain to me because I need to wrap my mind around it. Some people, this is you. Some, people, some of you guys are very smart, highly educated. You love to read. And this is your approach because there are some people out there that will not come to know God unless you have a good discussion with them. You have a good conversation with them and point them to Christ using logic and reasoning. In order to grasp the gospel, some people need that. This is a powerful approach, guys, but it's not for everybody. I get that. But some people, they need a good, solid conversation, a good, solid discussion as to why things are the way they are to be more effective for them. Number three, the blind man's testimony. I love this one because everybody falls in this category. Everybody falls under this category. The blind man's testimonial approach, his testimony. I absolutely love this approach. Love it. John chapter 9, there's a blind man who was blind from birth. And the disciples come up to Jesus and say, hey, is this guy blind because of his parents' sin or because of his sin? I love Jesus' response. He said, no, this man was born blind so that the glory of God could be shown in his life. That's why he was born blind, so that I would receive the honor and the glory for his life. And Jesus spit on the dirt, made mud, washed his face with mud, told him, so go wash out your eyes. He came back and the, and the young man could see. He was blind and now he could see. And all the skeptics all said, well, who is this guy? Who's this sinner, this blasphemer that healed this man on the Sabbath? And who are you that you were once blind? How is this even possible? They began questioning this young man. They began pushing him and accusing him that something was, was wrong or immoral about what had happened. They even took the young man to his parents' house. And they looked at his parents and said, you got to explain this. Was this man really born blind? Is this your son? Who was this person that healed him? The parents say, hey, listen, he's old enough to speak for himself. Why don't you ask him? I love that. He said, why don't you just ask him? He's old enough to speak for himself. And they began to push this man again, all these skeptics. And the blind man simply said, listen, I don't know. I ain't got all the answers. I don't know if this, this Jesus is a blasphemer or if he's a sinner. I'm not sure about all that. But that's one thing I'll tell you. I was once blind, but now I can open my eyes. Now I can see. So there's a big deal. And here's what's cool. Continue to read. People believe because of the man's testimony, because of what he shared. I love, I love the fact, if, you, if you're reading John 9, it's about halfway through, and, and they're pushing him at, at his parents' house. They're pushing him to be like, who is this man, and how did you do this, and blah, blah, blah. And they keep asking all these questions, and the, and the blind man says, you asking all these questions, do you want to become a believer? <laughs> and he, says, he says, do you not want to know more? Did you not hear what I just said? He says, do you not want to become a follower? <laughs> I love that. He just turns it around back on them. But anybody can share a testimony. Some people, guys, they need the emotional side you got to touch the heart. you got to touch the nerve that's going to spark up interest to a story. How many guys love stories? I love stories. That was a major method of Jesus' teaching was telling stories, telling parables. That's a big deal, huge deal. Many people will be steered away from an argument like Paul. And here's the deal. The, the, the blind man, what if he would have started a theological debate with him? That wouldn't have worked. Apostle Paul would have jumped all over that. Right? What if he would have looked at him and said, man, listen, you need to just shut your mouth and believe, because that's what Peter would have said. But the blind man didn't use Peter's approach, did he? He spoke from his experience. Everybody say experience. Don't you love it when someone tells you something, and they're speaking from their heart, and they really care about you and your situation, and they begin to speak from their own experience? Your ears perk up, don't you? Because you're like, huh, I wonder how this is going to pan out for their life. It's more interesting. Some people need your personal testimony. Some people need your personal story. God created every person. Every person has a story, and every story matters to God. When's the last time you shared your testimony with somebody about what God healed you from, what God has brought you from? When's the last time you looked at someone and you told them, listen, bro, I ain't got all the answers? Just like, like again, he didn't do Paul's approach. He didn't do Peter's approach. He did his own approach. Testimony. 
He said, listen, I ain't got all the answers. I can't tell you a whole lot about this Jesus on this and that. And I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm reading. I can't answer all these theological and philosophical questions right now. But one thing I do tell you is my marriage was a wreck and God saved it. I was headed to hell in my personal life because of my sin. And God has saved me and redeemed me. I was bankrupt. I was about to sign the papers and God restored my personal finances when I started doing things God's way. How about just a little testimony? When's the last time you shared your story? Some people will listen to a personal testimony. They ain't going to listen to no no philosophical argument. They're not going to listen to some theological debate. And and it's not going to work that you just shoot them straight and quit beating around the bush and tell them, hey, man, if you don't change your life, you're going to bust hell wide open. Sometimes they don't work with people. They need to hear your story. They need to hear your testimony. When's the last time you shared your testimony? Matthew's, number four, Matthew's interpersonal testimony. Approach. Matthew's interpersonal approach. Luke chapter 5. Jesus walks by the tax collector's booth and sees Levi. Another name for Levi was Matthew. Jesus said, stand up. Come follow me. The Bible says that Levi, Matthew, stood up behind the tax collector's booth and went and became a believer. Followed Jesus right there on the spot. Not only that, not only did he choose to believe and follow Christ, what's really cool about Luke 5 is then Matthew invites people to his house. He has some people over. He just wants to hang out with a bunch of sinners. So Matthew's hanging out with sinners, eating supper. And here's the cool thing. Jesus is there. Matthew knew that inviting people over to his house for supper and for dinner, having good Christian fellowship, having the the Savior of the world being there, by the way, He knew it was something good was going to happen. And if you continue to read, Matthew did not share his testimony. Matthew didn't even stand up and and preach the gospel. Matthew didn't get into a philosophical debate. Matthew just said, hey, man, y'all come hang out. Let's eat. Because he knew they were going to be surrounded by good characters and good people, good company. And the cool thing is, the Pharisees chimed in like who is this Jesus? who who are you Matthew who who is this Jesus would be hanging out with a bunch of sinners Jesus's response he said listen I came to seek and to save that which is lost it's not the healthy that need a doctor it's the sick when's the last time you hung out with a sinner when's the last time you hung out with a lost person called somebody that you knew beyond beyond a shadow of a doubt you knew they didn't believe in Christ you called them say man let's go hang out Maybe just somebody that's far from God. You don't even really know if they're a believer or not. It's just kind of a, a, kind of a gray area. I'm not sure if they're a believer or not. But, you know, I'm going to call them up. I'm going to invite them to a Braves game. I'm just going to love them. I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to take them out to dinner, buy them one of them $12 hot dogs. I'm going to do it. <laughs> When's the last time you hung out with somebody? Purposefully. Purposefully for the sake of them introducing them to Jesus. And if you read Luke chapter 5, going down to verse 33 and down, people. Many people, the Bible says, believed in Jesus that day because of Matthew. Sometimes, listen, if you don't get anything, please get this. Sometimes in life, when it comes to evangelism, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. A great illustration for this, and I ask permission to share this, a great illustration of this is about four years ago, my buddy, uh, my buddy Bill was hanging out with his buddy Kyle. They went fishing down here at the lake. They called up and said, hey, can we go fishing at the lake? Sure, man. Thanks for calling. Come on down there. Go fish. So Bill is invested into Kyle, building a friendship with him. Bill says, hey, what you doing tomorrow, Kyle? So out there, out there, just fishing. He said, what you doing tomorrow? Not, not much. Bill said, why don't you come on up there with me and eat? We're going to have a big old wild game supper up here at the church, and uh, we're going to blow some stuff up, shoot some shotguns, skeet shoot. He, Kyle, being the country boy that he is, he's like, game on. Let's do it. You know what, Kyle, you know what happened to Kyle that very next day? He made a decision. He made a decision. And today, we can't get rid of him. You know what I'm talking about, Kyle Huckabee. He's the man. He's a servant at heart. Servant at heart. But Bill just took it upon himself, said, you know what, I'm going to hang out with this kid. I'm going to hang out with this guy. He hung out with him, went fishing with him. Put, put some time, put some effort. It's like an investment account, guys. You're putting in, you're putting in slowly and consistently, putting in, putting in, and one day you'll see the rate of return. One day it'll be good. It takes some time. It's the same thing. You've got to put some skin in the game, baby. 
you got to invest in somebody. you got to have them over to your house. you got to take them to a ball game. you got to take them out to eat. Invite them over. Do something. you got to put some time in. you got to invest. Invest a little bit. Invest a little bit. And it may take some time. It may take some days, some weeks, some months. Some of you guys, I know you were, you were praying and, and seeking the Lord with a, with a spouse for years. Investing slowly but surely over time and over time. And now you see that return, don't you? You see that return. Sometimes, guys, people don't need a finger in their face. They don't want to discuss theology. They don't want you to, they don't, they don't want you to, they don't want to hear your testimony. Sometimes people just want to hang out. And the fact that good, good company, right, will impact your character, just like bad company corrupts good character, same thing. Let's just get people around some good Christian environments. Maybe, just maybe, it'll start to rub off on them and rub off on them and rub off, rub off on them. I'm thankful for Kyle hanging out that day and making the decision to rededicate his life to the Lord. And now, man, he's just a servant. We're thankful for that. Number five, the Samaritan's invitational approach. Samaritan's invitational approach. John chapter 4, 28 through 29, and then 39 through 41. We see to the Samaritan woman, right? Immoral. That's why she's there in the middle of the day drawing water because people will go in the cool of the day or in the evening. She's there in the middle of the day because she don't want to be seen. You know why? Because she's sleeping around. She's immoral. She's had many husbands. The person she's with now is not even her husband. So she knows she's an outcast. She knows that people don't like her. She knows people look down on her. So she don't want to interact with anybody in the community. Well, Jesus is there at the well. And you all know the story. If you don't, the gist of it is that she is going to this well, and she's getting her water every single day, and she's going. She has to come back. She gets some more. She has to come back, never fully satisfying her. And Jesus makes a cool connection, a little parallel in the spiritual realm. He tells this young lady, he says, hey, just like you come here every day for physical water, he said, your, your well's empty. And what you're doing, you're, tr- you're going to the things of this world. You're going to all these relationships with these guys. You're trying to fill a hole in your heart that only I can fit in. And Jesus says, you drink of me, you consume of me, You'll never be thirsty again. I will satisfy that hole in your soul that only is God-shaped and God-sized. Jesus says, I'll satisfy that. So why don't you drink of me? Let me be the one that's going to quench your thirst. Let me be the one that's going to fill you and satisfy you. The Bible says that the lady ran to her village, ran back to her village and began inviting everybody. Hey, come and see. Come and see this man. He told me everything that I've ever did. Please come and see this man. He's the Savior. I think he's the Messiah. Y'all just come and see. The Samaritan woman's invitational approach. When's the last time you invited somebody to something? When's the last time? Let me me just ask you this, because I believe it's 50% or more in this room. We're about to find out. If not, I'll be embarrassed. Here's the deal. Raise your hand if the reason why you're here today or you're plugged into Jesus today or the fact that you're even saved or even thinking about it, the fact that you're here in some shape, form, or fashion, spiritually sense, the fact that you're here is because somebody at some point invited you. Sweet. 50%. All right. Probably 70%. That's a lot. The power of an invitation. The power of an invitation. Just inviting someone. Hey, man, come to our life group. We're going to eat, and we're going to hang out, we're going to talk a little bit about the Bible, but I'll tell you, it's going it's to be able to, you're going to be able to leave there with some, with some application to live your life better. Hey, hey, come to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're, we're talking about right now different world religions and different denominations and, and how to defend our faith, which is all based out of 1 Peter 3.15, by the way. Always be prepared to give an answer for the faith in which you believe, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's what the Bible says. Sometimes people just need an invite. They just need an invite. Listen, growing up, I had a major drug problem growing up. My parents drug me to church every Sunday. There was no invite. My parents like, get your butt in the minivan. We're going to church, right? There wasn't no, I'm going to invite my son to church. No, you get your butt in the van. Shut the door. We going. And guess what? The fact that they drug me to church every week. Hey, man, I love church now. I'm a a preacher. All right, listen, so you saying, well, I'm not going to drag my kids to church. I'm not going to always invite my kids. You doggone keep inviting them. One day they go, oh, all right, dadgummit, all right, I'll come, right? And that may be the day that they hear the gospel for the first time in, a way that they, in the way that God would have them to hear it through a testimony, through an invitation, through a personal relationship, through the direct approach. 
through intellectual. God designs the service. There's been so many times on Monday mornings when we get together with our staff, Mark says, you won't believe who texts me. Check this out, man. God saved them. God did something great. And blah, blah. He said the sermon was just what they needed. I'm thinking 500 people, the sermon was just what they need. It was just what I need. That's not fair. You know, it was just exactly what I needed for that moment. Isn't that cool how God does that? People say, well, the preacher's been reading my mail. He ain't got time to read his mail. He ain't reading your mail. What you talking about? <laughs> God orchestrates, God puts people in places that they're supposed to be so that you receive what you're supposed to receive. How does that work? I have no clue. I guarantee you, I guarantee you somebody will text me tomorrow or today and say, wow, Dave, I've been praying that God would show me how to evangelize to my coworkers. And man, you just unleashed it. Thank you. Somebody will do that tomorrow. I guarantee you. Not knowing at all what we we're going to talk about today. And you're here today and you've been praying, God, I know there's a coworker and I need to share my faith with, but I don't know how. I guarantee you, God's working. Invitational approach, quick example. My boy Jay Eubanks back there, a good friend of mine. I love Jay. He's one of our deacons. Invi invited a coworker to come to church. Just invited. Hey, man, won't you come to church with us one day? His coworker said, All right, well, I'll come check it out. Well, guess what? He came and checked it out. Not only did he check it out, but now he's serving. His wife sings. His two daughters sang this morning, and he's the deacon. His name's Travis Weed. All because of an invite. All because of an invitation. So, hey, man, why don't you just come? Why don't you just come, man? You can sit with us. What's funny is the day that Travis decided to come, he was driving up here to the mountain, and he texts Jay. He's like, hey, man, I'm almost there at the ridge. And Jay's like, oh, shoot, I'm out of town today. I'm not even there. You can't even sit with me. Oh, and by the way, we're not even at the ridge. We're at the Fine Arts Center. So Travis's like, his wheel's like, oh, my gosh, right? But guess what? God still moved. God still drew them here. His wife's been baptized. They've made a commitment to, the, to serve the Lord here, and we're honored to have them. Can I get an Amen. All because of an invite. So when is the last time you invited somebody? When's the last time you extended an invitation? Again, how many, how many of you guys are here because of an invitation at some point in your life? One more time, raise your hand. 70% of you guys. So you understand the power of an invitation then, don't you? Because that's why you're here. Because someone spent the time, a few moments, said, hey, would you just come? You can come sit with me. And the day you decide to come, I won't be there. And the location will be wrong, but you can still go. I'm just picking on y'all there. We're proud of Jay. We're proud of the weeds. Good, good, good example there. God gave me that this morning. I asked, I asked, if, I asked uh, Travis if I could use that, by the way. Number six, Tabitha's service approach. Well, one more thing on Samaritans. One, back up. One more thing. The Bible says, if you go and read verse 41 and on in John chapter 4, talking about the Samaritan woman, the Bible says that the lady began to say, come and see, come and see, inviting people to Jesus. And because of that, Jesus stayed two more days. And the Bible says many more people believed in Christ because of her invitation. Many more people. Awesome. Verse, uh, number six, Tabitha's service approach. Tabitha's service approach. Acts chapter 9, 36 and following. Tabitha was always doing good, the Bible said. Tabitha was, was knitting and sewing and making clothes for the poor, making clothes for the widows and the orphans. Tabitha was one of these people that I would probably call, this is a behind-the-scenes approach, in other words. Tabitha's service approach is not in the spotlight. This is the person that's writing checks to Doug and saying, hey, put this on so-and-so's mission account, but don't tell him where it came from which we have a very, very generous church, and that happens all the time. It's already happened for, um, for youth ministry this, this year. I had somebody come and write me a check for $500 and say, here, put this on a youth account. Somebody needs it. Someone needs it to go, and they can't afford to go. Take care of them. I'm like, man, that's stinking awesome. And the person said, don't tell nobody it was me. Understood. Yes, sir. Tabitha's service approach. She's serving making clothes for the widows, making clothes for the orphans, those that are on the outcast, she don't want any attention. She don't want the recognition. She don't want a, a, a pat on the back. She don't want the attaboy. She don't want the spotlights. This is a behind-the-scenes approach of serving people. Her life was so important. Listen to this. Her life was so important, Acts chapter 9. She had a premature death. She died of an illness. Jesus sent Peter to go raise her from the dead. I said, get back to work. I'm not done with you yet. That's how cool. That's how important her, her way of evangelism was, her approach to just serve people, 
serve people. When's the last time you went out of your way to serve somebody? There may be that coworker, you know what I'm talking about, that one that's grumpy, no one likes talking to them, they think they're always right, they're not going to listen to anything you got to say. Guess what? You ain't going to use Peter's approach. You ain't even going to use Paul's approach. They don't care about your testimony. Okay? They don't want you to invite them to church. None of those work. This may be you. Maybe that guy, that, that coworker that you're talking about, who's grumpy, he's rude, no one likes him. Maybe you go buy his lunch and you go put it right there in front of him at the cafeteria. He goes, what'd you do that for? I just wanted to, man. Maybe the next day goes by. You go get him a Coke from the Coke machine, vending machine, put it on his desk. Hey, man, just want to give that to you. What you doing that for? I just wanted to, man. So again, you start serving somebody. You start doing things for people. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, someone's going to say, man, why do you keep doing this? There's your opportunity. That's your opportunity right there. I remember Pastor Mark, we went to Point University this week to uh, talk to some of their, uh, their, their representatives over there. Uh, they're going to be partnering with us for, uh, for Rush Weekend. And the guy was asking Mark about Jamaica in the years and years that we've, they, you know, we've been doing Jamaica. I say we, I've only been about three times, but Mark's been for like 30,000 times. But, you know, he was, he was saying, yeah, you know, this, this, that, other. And the guy said, well, who's your connection? Do you know anybody there? Like, you know, that, and he said, well, we know a guy named Pastor Maxo. And then he said, I actually, God actually orchestrated for, we actually met the prime minister of Jamaica. He said, how did that happen? It was a really cool story. I didn't know this until just the other day. But Pastor Mark, they went over there one time. This was years and years ago. They were going door to door praying for people and counseling because there was some type of rivalry in one, on one of the cities that they were in on the island of Jamaica. And the police force was like, hey, we, need just, we just need some pastors and preachers to come door to door, talk to people, counsel with people, pray for people, and just, just try to settle down this issue. So the team, the Rush Mission team, started doing that, going door to door like they always do, praying for people, counseling people, talking to people, encouraging them. Well, the local news channel found out about it. The local news channel starts filming them. Well, guess who's watching the news that day? The prime minister of Jamaica. Basically the president. Saying, who are these people? Who is the, what is this rush? What are these white Americans doing on our island going door to door doing stuff for free for? What are they doing that for? So long story short, prime minister hooks up with the chief of police. Chief of police comes and talks to Mark. He's like, Mark, the prime minister wants to meet you. So he's like, all right. So he met them, and the prime minister looked at him like, why are y'all doing what you're doing? Why are you serving our community? Why are you doing all this for free? <laughs> Again, perfect opportunity. He said, man, because we love Jesus. And because we know that Jesus is the hope of the world. And we just want to love people and talk to people and point people to their creator so they can have a relationship with him. That's why we're here. Again, if you just start serving, if you just start serving, people will notice. And people want to say, why are you doing what you're doing? One thing I love about this is <laughs> Tabitha was old. She was, she was well in her years serving the Lord. And I began to think about that and just like, God, what does that mean, Lord? Show, show me an example. And God just kept bringing it to my, to my attention, sanctification, sanctification. Simon, God, what, what do you mean sanctification? The process of being sanctified means being, being made more like Jesus each and every day. Sanctification is the process that you and I, as believers, are being made more and more like Christ each and every day. We're being made more holy every day like Him. Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, I, the Son of Man, the Son of God, I have not come to be served, but what? To serve. So each and every day, we're being made more and more like Christ. We're being made more and more like Jesus. How can we be more like Jesus than when we're serving? than when we're serving people. So as you get older, as you come into your, your golden years, you're coming toward retirement, don't think about it as, oh God, finally, I worked my tail off. Finally, I can relax and do whatever, whatever I want to do. Don't have that worldly mentality. Say, wow, God has now blessed me with more time. Yes, I'm going to spend it with my family and my grandkids. Yes, but man, God, what would you have me to do? Because God, now i got more time than ever that I can serve you and serve your kingdom. Now I can really serve you, God, more than I ever have in my life. God, now I have time that I can truly pour into people, and I can serve people, and I can do what you called me to do. And that may be on the mission field. That may be at the local church. That may be at the local community center. That may be in your own ministry that you start. Always look for opportunities as you get older to serve more. Serve more. Don't be thinking, man, it's time to wind down. Like, no, I'm time to dial it up, baby. I got more free time now. I'm going to really crank it up. I want to serve the Lord. I only get one life to live. And my, Brent, my boy Brent Franklin always says, you, you, and you sleep a third of it. 
Think about it. 24 hours a day, you sleep eight, a third of your day is gone. So do the math. You live to be 90 years old, guess what? You've slept 30 years out of those 90 years. You get 60 years to make an impact. You're going to sleep a third of your life. Life is but a mist, James 4. Life is but a mist. It's but a vapor. It's here for a moment. And then it's gone. The psalmist says, Psalm 93 says, My life, O Lord, is no longer than the width of my hand. That's what the psalmist says. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. I got this much time to make an impact. I got this much time to share Christ. It doesn't matter whether that's a direct statement and t- looking somebody in the face and go, man, you got to quit playing games with God. You got to give your heart to Jesus. Some people need that heart, that tough love. Some people, you need to get in this book and you need to read it. And there's that guy at work and you know he's very intelligent. He's very smart. You got to get your A game ready. You got to go ahead and you got to f- find some answers because that's what he's looking for. He's just looking for an answer. And as soon as he gets that answer, he's ready to give his life to Jesus. He's just looking for that answer. You give him the answer. Maybe it's the testimony approach, the blind man's testimony. Some people don't want a debate. They don't want a discussion. They just want to hear truth from you. They want to hear from your experience. A heartfelt story pierces the hearts of people. You just tell them your testimony. Maybe it's the interpersonal. Maybe you're like Matthew. You're just supposed to hang out with people. When was the last time you hung out with a bunch of sinners for the sake of saying, you know what, I'm going to rub off on them. I have, my head, I have my head on straight, my heart's in the right place. I am purposefully going to hang out with these people so that I can rub off on them. And maybe, just maybe, they'll come to know Christ. Maybe it's, you just need to spend time with somebody at your work, a family member. They're going through a rough time. Maybe they just, they're looking for someone that would stop and care about them. People want to know that you care. Maybe it's the invitation. When's the last time you invited somebody? Invite them to your life group. Invite them to Sunday morning worship. Invite them to Rush. Invite them to the fall festival. Invite them to the Christmas show. Invite them to something where you know the gospel will be presented. And maybe, just maybe, God will touch their heart and draw them in. And they'll come to repentance and say, man, I have been missing it. I have been missing it. I've been trying to live life all on my own, trying to do things my way, and I can't do it. I'm at the end of my rope. I've hit rock bottom. Let me tell you something about rock bottom. Rock bottom is a great place to be. That means there's only one way out, baby. (laughs) We're going up. We're going up. Rock bottom is also a good place to lay a new foundation. Can I get an amen? That's a good time. So maybe you know somebody that's at rock bottom. Maybe you just need to hang out with them. Maybe invite them. Maybe do Tabitha's approach and serve them. This method is slow and steady. Serve them. Last but not least, and we're done. So students, if you're in here and uh, you're going to serve for our barbecue lunch, and if you would, just go ahead and make your way out. There's about 20 of you guys or so. And uh, give them a heads up that we're coming out early. That's what happens when you got a substitute preacher. You're getting out early. Look at that, 1208, baby. All right. Here's the deal. Number seven. Y'all ready for this? This is the most profound point of all. This is the best method of evangelism of all of them. You ready? Go ahead and hit it. Be yourself. Hit it. Somebody got it? Be yourself. That's our last point. Number seven, be yourself. One of the best things I ever heard at Bible college was this preacher got up, and we were in our preaching class, and the preacher got up and said, yeah, y'all, I know y'all listen to these podcasts, and y'all watch these YouTube videos, and y'all see all these phenomenal preachers all around the world. He says, let me tell you something. You get up there, and you just be yourself. You get up there, and you just be Dave. Ain't, can't nobody else be Big Dave but me. That's me. I'm David. Can't nobody be Pastor Mark but Pastor Mark. Can't nobody be Pastor Keith but Keith. I can get up there and I can try, but I can't do it. It's not me. That's him. He's being himself. Tyler's being himself. Evangelism, listen to me. Evangelism is God speaking through your personality. Did you catch that? Evangel- personal evangelism is God speaking through your personality. Just be yourself. Don't try to be somebody you're not. You say, David, I'm not very hospitable. That's not my spiritual gift. I, hospitality in me, just, it, it's just like oil and water. It just doesn't mix. not going to happen. Well, I would encourage you, don't do Matthew's interpersonal approach. Don't invite people to your house. Don't do that. That's not good. If hospitality is not, your, is not your spiritual gift, don't invite nobody to your house for, the, for, the, for, the, for this point, okay? Don't do that, okay? 
But maybe, just maybe, you say, David, I'm just kind of behind the scenes person. I'm not big on, you know, the theological debates and philosophical debates, and I'm not going to point my fingers at I'm just more behind the scenes. Well, doggone. Tabitha's service approach. Sounds like that fits you just fine. And we could go through and I could do every single example. Be you. Just be you. And realize this, that there are people in the world today that are waiting for you. They're waiting for your invitation. They're waiting for your service. They're waiting for your direct approach. They're waiting for your intellectual conversation. They're waiting for your testimony. They're waiting for your interaction personally. They're waiting for you. God has specifically put people on this earth that they're supposed to connect with your personality in order to be saved. I was talking to someone the other day. They were talking about, you know, just there's 88 churches in Upson County and, and this, that, and the other. I said, man, we need all 88 of them. You know why? Because there's 88 different preachers. 88 different preachers. They all don't have the same style. They're not all personal. They're not all service-oriented. They're not all turn or burn. They're, they're all different. And there's 30,000 people in Upson County. And they all learn different. They're all going to be touched different. We need every single one of these preachers. We need more of them. Because they all got a different personality, and that's God speaking through them. There are people that will come here and not connect and they need to go down the road to Clark's Chapel. They need to go to First Baptist. They need to go to Mountain View. Because maybe they don't connect here. And the same is true, vice versa. That's okay. We're all in this together. One team, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're all in this together. Every church has got a personality. Every church has a different personality. Every church, listen, we've, we've just seen, we've seen God do something in the way that we do things. We love doing evangelistic outreach, big events. It just works for us. It it, we've seen it work. That's not the case for every church, and that's okay. Every church is different just like every person is different. As we close, as the invitation is about to be given, sing a song of closing. Just be yourself, man. Just be yourself. Don't try to be somebody you're not. I'm not up here trying to be like any famous preacher. Listen, I'm me. You don't like me, that's okay. I like me. <laughs> it's okay. I'm just going to be me. So here's a challenge. Just be you. Just be yourself. God only made one of you. Just one. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're done. I hope and pray that one of these styles of evangelism touched your heart today. I hope and pray that you understand that we cannot sit back and think, oh, well, everybody else is going to evangelize. I'm just going to kind of live my life. And no, no, that's unrealistic. That's an unrealistic expectation on your part. To say, well, if I don't share Christ with that person, well, somebody else will come along maybe. Maybe, maybe just maybe God puts you there for a specific reason, for a specific purpose, for such a time as this, to share Christ with that one person. That's their opportunity. And you need to take full responsibility for that. I need to take full responsibility for that. Don't miss opportunities, guys. Don't miss opportunities. So every head bowed, every eye closed, every eye closed and short, sweet, and simple, man. If you don't know Christ, what are you waiting on? If you don't know Jesus as the personal Lord of Savior of your life, and I'm just I'm sorry, I'm just gonna shoot you straight like Peter, because that's just kind of who I am. You need Jesus. Look, listen to me. You need Jesus. You don't need Jesus because you may die tonight, though that's true. You could pull out of this parking lot, you could get hit by a car, and you could die. But I'm not gonna tell you you need Jesus because you may die tonight. I'm gonna tell you you need Jesus because you just might wake up in the morning. That's why you need him. Because you may live your life tomorrow. And if you live your life tomorrow, you need to live your life for the Savior of the world, the one who gives you hope and gives you forgiveness. Have you been forgiven of your sin? Ask God to forgive you. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I have screwed up my life. Every sin possible, pretty much I've done it, God, and you know that. Just talk to him. Be real with him, man. It doesn't have to be some intellectual, philosophical, theological prayer. Talk to him like you talk to your mom or your dad or your best friend. Say, God, man, I've made a mess of things. But God, I ask you to forgive me. God, I ask you to come into my life and save me because I know I can't save myself. And God, change me from the inside out. <sighs> Make me a new person, God, please. Help me to live for you until the day you call me home. If you prayed a prayer like that and you meant every word of it, for the very, listen, you only got to pray, pray a prayer of salvation one time. Salvation prayer is not every week. It's a one-time ordeal. 
You give your life to Jesus. And listen, we fall, we mess up. We may need to still come and repent and restore that fellowship, but you don't have to get back on one knee. When, fellas, when you, when you do something stupid with your wife, you don't have to get back on one knee the next day and say, hey, well, I'm sorry, baby, will you marry me again? I know I said something stupid yesterday and I shouldn't have said that. She goes, no, get up off that knee, boy. You don't have to marry, I don't have to marry you again. Let's just work things out. It's the same thing with God. You're married. It's a done deal. It's a contract. Your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You don't have to get down on one knee and say, God, please save me again. He says, get up, boy. You're not a son, son because, you're, because of worth. You're a son because of birth. So maybe you just prayed and received Christ for the first time. No one's looking around but me. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Would there be anybody? Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to worship. And we're done. If you want to come pray, come pray. You want to join our church. The doors are wide open. You want to come and say, God, give me strength, Lord, to figure out how I need to evangelize. We're going to sing a, a verse, of course, and we're wrapping it up, guys. Y'all come pray if you want to come pray.